This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Once again, it's Mises Weekends, and we're joined for the second time. We're so pleased to have him back. Uh, Godfrey Bloom, speaking to us from the UK, uh, uh, a former uh, MEP from Yorkshire, and uh, um, also a UKIP member at one time. And uh, Godfrey, are you missing your time in Brussels, or are you happy to just be at home these days? Uh, well, <laughs> I'm very glad to be out of it, to be brutally honest. Uh, it's an awful place. I don't like the city. I don't <laughs> like the people. Um, I'm ghastly, and I'm very glad to be out of it, especially as we've won. Well, l- let me ask you this. Uh, you know, just recently, the past couple of days, uh, Theresa May signed the formal letter that was delivered to the uh, European Council president uh, that the UK will be going ahead and triggering Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty. Are you at all surprised by her steadfastness, by some of her, her, her strong comments since the Brexit vote? Is, is she, are you pleasantly surprised by Theresa May's uh, response to Brexit? Uh, well, sadly, no, but that's probably now because I've been in the Brexit fight for over 25 years and I've seen betrayal after betrayal after betrayal. Uh, I've heard politicians talk a good story and then collapse when it comes to the actual doing thing. When it comes to the action, uh, you know, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And I've just I've become very cynical, I'm afraid, about this procedure uh, as I get older. Well, I got to tell you, though, I'm reading that it, it sounds like there's there's a significant difference between the uh, sentiment surrounding Brexit in, in the UK and the sentiment surrounding Trump in the US. In other words, it sounds like, at least from from our vantage point, that uh, members of parliament are accepting a Brexit and willing to vote for it, uh, that the general public has become uh, more accepting of Brexit. It sounds like the Remain office is just some tiny office now, whereas in the U.S., the, the anti-Trump forces, both left and right, are invigorated. They're fighting him. They're talking about impeachment. They're talking about impeding him at every step. There's no Trump acceptance movement uh, over here, but it sounds like Brexit is, is something that the, that the people of the United Kingdom have become more comfortable with. Uh, Yes, uh, the people most certainly, but we have a big problem uh, like you have. Uh, I think you call it deep state uh, over there. Uh, We don't have that expression really here, but the point is the same. You have to bear in mind that the Prime Minister, Theresa May, campaigned for Remain, although not particularly enthusiastically. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, who's number two on the Bren, as it were, he's number two, uh, is a staunch Remainer. The Home Secretary is a Remainer. That's probably number three or four on the Bren. Uh, The uh, Foreign Office is um, completely devoted to the European Union project. So every single senior civil servant is devoted. You couldn't get promoted in the civil service unless you were committed to the EU project. It just wasn't on. Uh, So there's a whole generation now of very senior civil servants who don't want Brexit to work. Uh, We have a public service broadcasting, the BBC and Channel 4 over here, which are owned and monitored and run by the state. And the senior appointments are state appointees, uh, and they are committed quite deeply to the European Union project. So while the people, this has always been about the people against the establishment, and the people are committed to Brexit, ordinary working people, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, the cabbie, the hairdresser, are all committed to Brexit, but the establishment, the ruling classes, are not. And that's what gives me cause for concern. Yeah, well, certainly same situation here. We definitely have a a deep cadre of civil servants who are diametrically opposed to anything that Trump suggests. And they've been there a long time. They have federal government unions, and uh, they they will survive long beyond Trump. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about this. What I'm reading, this, this seems seemingly is endless negotiations we have until March 2019 uh, for the ratification of Brexit. Uh, talk about what what is this vote that the, the European Parliament has to take to permit Brexit? I, I mean, why, why does the European Parliament have to allow you to leave this union? Uh, well, the whole thing, of course, is completely and totally absurd. Uh, The whole uh, structure of Article 50, the whole structure of the Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty uh, designed to let people leave the European Union 
uh, had been put together specifically to make it difficult for people to leave. Um, you know, these all these uh, all these civil servants and European civil servants um, regard Brexit as being absolute catastrophe. So they're not going to make it easy uh, with that with that in mind. And of course. Uh, we know, uh, we, we, we uh, Mises Institute supporters and members, we know that politicians and civil servants don't understand trade and economics. They don't understand it. And why would they? They go from university into politics directly or into the civil service. So here we have a situation where every politician and every civil servant actually believes genuinely believes you need politicians and civil servants to negotiate trade. And of course, we know that it's about manufacturers, people who want to sell goods to us and the consumer. Uh, that's what it's about, not about civil servants. If you leave your golf cup, for example, Jeff, you don't call in your lawyer and advisory civil servants to negotiate leaving the golf club. You just write a nice letter and say, thank you, it's been great, and you go. What on earth we're going to negotiate for two years is utterly beyond me. What are they going to talk about? Well, I even, I even, I'm even reading in the Wall Street Journal that there's talk about a payment to exit the block. They're talking about maybe 50 billion euro uh, as a, uh, a penalty of sorts to, p to pay for some of the agreements that it was presumed uh, Britain would continue to be a part of. So, so you might get hit with an exit penalty. Well, yes, of course, of which there is no legal basis, but that doesn't matter. Uh, this is opening the batting for negotiation. Uh, so you have this rather bizarre, uh, almost sitcom type of arrangement where they are threatening, uh, they are threatening uh, to fine us 50 billion pounds or 50 billion euros. Otherwise, they won't sell us their Mercedes, Volkswagens, BMWs, Peugeots and French wine. Uh, it reminds me of you, your, your younger listeners might, might not remember Blazing Saddles. Uh, you know, when the guy, the sheriff puts a gun to his own head and says, one pace forward and I'll pull the trigger, which is, of course, is exactly what the European Union are doing. Uh, if we don't behave, they'll shoot their own heads off. I mean, you couldn't invent all this. It's totally ridiculous. Well, if anybody's listening who's, let's say, under 30 and you haven't seen Blazing Saddles, shame on you. You need to rent that this weekend. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about globalism. That's really the the underlying uh, tension that's at work here. You know, obviously, from our perspective, Mises saw globalism as about trade and travel and open communications, but but he also saw globalism as as resting on the differences between nations. In other words, comparative advantage uh, among trading partners. Whereas our, our our friends on the left, progressives, and a lot of left libertarians as well, are, are what I would call universalists. In other words, they see globalism based on our similarities rather than our trading differences. It, it, do you think? Do you think there's still a, an existential fight in the British people, or have they? You think? You think they've just swallowed this? Uh, well, it's very difficult because we have this rather extraordinary situation where uh, globalism. We regard to globalism. Um, we talk about globalism over here, but people don't talk about globalism as it is seen by Mises supporters. Um, they talk about, of course, and uh, the Americans started it, shame on you, the term liberal. The term li liberal has been brought into disrepute. Um, people who are liberal and our Liberal Democrat Party here and your reference to liberals in the United States, of course, is fascism. And I don't use that word as a pejorative term. I use it as a system of government, fascism, which is broadly control um, you know, but, but an alliance, an unholy alliance between big business and politicians. So we talk about failure of capitalism, but we don't have capitalism, do we? We have mercantilism. But of course, everybody who comes out of a state university these days is steeped in Keynesian theory. So we have people uh, who don't really understand their own subjects. And so they constantly use the wrong phrases all the time. Well, what strikes me as as the fly in the ointment is something that Theresa May brought up the other day, even if Brexit goes smoothly. Uh, thank God you've got the pound sterling, of course, uh, but you're still a member of the UN Security Council and you're still a member of NATO. So that seems to me the, the, the ultimate entanglement that, that, Im, that impedes Brexit in a certain sense. In other words, how can you truly become a sovereign UK uh, when you're still committed both militarily and financially to the 
in theory, the military defense of, of Europe as a whole. Uh, well, of course, uh, that is a big problem. And I think it comes in two stages. And you're quite right to flag that up. Firstly, you're not a sovereign nation unless your final court of appeal legally is in your own country. Uh, you cannot uh, you cannot subcontract your final court of appeal, which is what we've done for the last 40 odd years to the European Court of Justice or the European Court of Human Rights. That means you are not a sovereign nation. Uh, you must make your own laws. Your own parliament must be the final arbiter of your laws. Uh, and your, our House of Lords is an amending chamber. If you don't have those two things, you're not a sovereign nation. And there's a question mark even now uh, whether we will go the whole hog when it comes to, uh, you know, our legal system taking precedence, the precedence of common law, uh, which, of course, started in this country with... Um, uh, Alfred the Great, it's well over a thousand years old. It's sort of 1400 years old, that concept of law, which has been subsumed by uh, the Napoleonic Code. But of course, the trouble is with state education in the United Kingdom, we have a whole generation who haven't been traditionally educated. Uh, your average youngster, even at a good university, is woefully inadequately educated uh, by the standards of a chap my age. I'm 67. Uh, you know, I don't regard them as having uh, had any form of education at all, frankly. They tick boxes. Uh, so uh, we have to have a real think about this. And as to NATO... Uh, I'm an ex-soldier. Most uh, old geezers of my age are, uh, are sort of had some military experience. Uh, I uh, was in uh, part of Fourth Armoured Division, a very minor cog in the wheel of Fourth Armoured Division in Germany. And in those days, of course, the Soviet Union was a potential threat. It was a huge military power. It was a communist state and it was a threat. Uh, of course, what, what what we have now, and this is all based, of course, as, as, as all your listeners will know, on the industrial, military and congressional congress. This is all about budgets. So we're trying to stir up this. Uh, we're trying to get another Cold War with Russia. Uh, and we're moving Canadian troops. NATO's moved Canadian and British troops into Latvia. What on earth Latvia can possibly have to do with Canadians is totally and utterly beyond me. Uh, uh, you know, and you've got to get a map out and have a look. So... Uh, we do have a problem. NATO is now an anachronism. I would get us out of NATO if I had my way. I'd wind it up and uh, because I think it served its purpose. It was excellent. I was a big supporter. But NATO now is the threat. NATO isn't our shield any longer. Uh, it's a very dangerous concept and it's expanding right up to the Russian border. And it worries ordinary people in the pubs and clubs uh, of, of, of England a lot. And I know it worries my American friends as well. Well, thankfully, we've got the, the U.S. left wing has now suddenly found a newfound obsession with the Soviet Union. But let me talk to you about the economy. There was, a, there was sort of a much ballyhooed hit that was going to take place to the British economy when, when the Brexit vote happened. The pound did go down. It, it seems like it's still down to about $1.25 versus the U.S. dollar. Uh, apart from that, do you, do, do you feel like there's, there are still tremors out there? Do people feel like... The, the economy is stable and that uh, Brexit won't necessarily harm it in the long run? Uh, well, of course, one has to look at the facts and of being a, an ex-investment manager and, in, and a specialist in fixed interest for many years. Uh, one has to look at why uh, the pound fell significantly against the dollar on Brexit. Uh, and of course, people say, oh, it was Brexit. But it just, you have to just analyse what happened. When the Leave uh, uh, campaign won, uh, Carney, Mark Carney, the uh, governor of the Bank of England, immediately announced that he would create as much quantitative easing as was necessary. It would be limitless. He halved interest rates. And the Chancellor, Hammond, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, said that he would tear up and abandon all fiscal targets, uh, you know, to pay off the national debt. Now, that's the reason sterling fell. Sterling, well, you would sell sterling. Who wouldn't sell sterling under those circumstances? Uh, this was panic at the Bank of England, nothing to do with Brexit. This is sheer panic uh, on behalf of the Bank of England, uh, who deliberately trashed the pound, quite deliberately, with those statements. I would have Mark Carney sent back to Canada tomorrow morning. The man's an incompetent buffoon. He has to go. And our Chancellor of the Exchequer is a very sad individual with no experience of anything at all. I wouldn't let him cut my hair. Yeah, it's interesting. We're starting to see in the U.S. as well some people really questioning central bankers in a way that they haven't for, for many, many decades. There was always this presumed expertise. And we, we found out, of course, it's, it's a complete house of cards in 2008. Uh, 
l- let me ask you this. From our perspective, uh, uh, you know, we read what we read in the U.S. media. We have to find alternative media online. It, it kind of feels like UKIP has run out of steam. Does UKIP have a purpose beyond Brexit? It, it feels like maybe it doesn't. Uh, No, I don't think it does. And I say that with heavy heart, Jeff. I say that with heavy heart. I was a founder member, a significant donor. uh, And in the constitution of UKIP, it uses the word libertarian. Uh, So once we got Brexit, we fought for Brexit, we got Brexit, or we got the referendum, although UKIP wasn't a major player in the referendum, uh, but it was a major player in getting the referendum. uh, And I hoped it would be small state uh, low tax environment, uh, radical, reformist, doing all the things that we all know in the Mises Institute that need to be done with the Western democracies. Um, but it lost its way uh, completely, which is why I left it three years ago. Um, you know, it, it, it's now a sort of another centre left party, and people are saying, uh, you know, the electorate are saying, we've already got that under Theresa May. We have a centre left party in government very strongly, and it's very strong. Uh, electoral support for it because people haven't been offered anything else. Uh, And so people are saying, my wife, for example, who is a a fairly typical uh, non- Non highly political individual. She's just an ordinary professional woman, uh, English woman. And her attitude is why would I bother to walk through the rain to vote for UKIP? What's in the shop window? And the answer is, of course, nothing. And so uh, they've, they've made the biggest mistake they've made is trying to get the Labour Party votes or trying to get fringe Conservative Party votes. All this is a mistake. The big market in the British electorate, the huge market, is people who gave up voting years ago. That's the biggest party. They're the biggest reservoir of voters in this country. People who just don't bother to vote because they don't think it makes any difference. And they're the people that we want. And they're the people that came out for Brexit. Uh, that was a 70 percent. It's the highest turnout England's ever seen. Um, and, and we voted for Brexit with the highest vote in the history of the United Kingdom. It's awesome because people felt that it would count and they came out and they voted in a referendum. But they're not going to bother to vote in a general election. Why would they? Well, I noticed the other day uh, Theresa May was uh, photographed with Nicola Sturgeon, the SNP leader from Scotland. Do you think Leave voters in the Brexit vote ha- have a, an obligation to support uh, the, the Scottish independence movement, whether they agree with its ultimate aims or not? In other words, is, shouldn't, they, shouldn't your average UKIPper support Scottish independence, even if Scotland might choose to be more left wing if it was independent? Uh, yes. Uh, well, it, it's it's a sort of personal thing. I think most Englishmen have a little bit of Scottish blood. I certainly do. My clan was uh, Bruce. I'm sort of one sixteenth or something jock. Uh, and the Institute of Economic Affairs run by a guy called Mark Littlewood, who's your sort of opposite number over here. I'm sure you've met him, um, who is a very sound man. He said that uh, if you look at the Scottish philosophers historically and the engineers and the soldiers, it is absurd to suggest that Scotland can't Uh, be an independent nation. Of course, Scotland can be an independent nation. But what it needs to do is elect politicians who aren't sort of of the Venezuelan socialist ilk. What they need to do uh, is get people who get back to that Presbyterian work ethic uh, that the Scots have, which made Scotland punch above its weight for so many decades, so many centuries in point of fact. Uh, But of course, now they're just whinging welfareists. Uh, They vote in the most appalling people. Uh, and, and and if they go, uh, if Scotland departs with them at the helm, uh, they'll be on the rocks in no time at all. And that's what I point out. Yes, go Scotland, be independent and very good luck to you. But for goodness sake, change your captain and your navigation officer. Yeah, well, we feel the same about California oftentimes here, my home state, sadly. Uh, last question for you, Godfrey. Uh, let's talk about France. N- neither one of us is an expert on French politics, but... In the Western media, France is being portrayed as next front on this globalism versus nationalism war. Um, it, obviously, France is a, is a member of the Eurozone. They, they use the euro. So if, if France was to ever consider – if France was to vote in a Marine Le Pen and then that was to trigger a Brexit-type uh, movement in France, th- that seems like a lot heavier lifting when you're talking about an actual member of the Eurozone. Do you think Le Pen has a chance and do you think Frexit has a chance? Uh, well, yes, I think it does. I had this conversation on email quite a lot with uh, our mutual friend, Pat Barron, uh, and we talk about this and he says, what do you think? Well, 
there was a number of uh, points to bear in mind. Um, the Fifth Republic, which, of course, uh, going back to, I think it was 1958, started by General de Gaulle, um, uh, and de Gaulle wanted a, uh, a a confederation of sovereign states as the European Union. He didn't want what there is now. So there's a very strong resentment in France about the way this project's gone. Uh, we're talking also about uh, Marine Le Pen overtaking the socialists. But if you look at her if you look at her economic policies, uh, if you leave aside the European Union and currencies, if you look at her policies, she's a socialist. I know her very well. Uh, she's very charming. Um, she, she's a very nice lady, uh, very articulate, uh, and, uh, and, and I wish her well. Um, but I don't agree with anything uh, that she says from a policy or economic policy or trade policy perspective. However, as I said to my chum, Pat Barron, um, she is the only person that can get France out of this terrible mess. And then France wants to reform from outside the European Union. And so I think her job, Marine Le Pen's job, is to take France out. And then we need to see a new French leader come in maybe after three, four, five, six years who can start dragging uh, France uh, into the 21st century. Now, whether that's going to happen, I don't know. But it can't continue as it is, that's for sure. Well, Godfrey Bloom, it's a fascinating topic we could go on. We hope we don't have to wait until March 2019 to talk to you again when Brexit uh, might be fully uh, negotiated and ratified. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.